Hello, and welcome to The Distillery. I'm your host, Harry Li Shanglun. Today, we have special guest with us, Asiel Adan Sanchez. How are you doing, Asiel? Hi, everyone. I'm, I'm pretty good. Can't complain here. Lovely rainy Saturday afternoon. What have you been up to today? Uh, today has been a bit of a, of a busy day, to be honest. I was at the clinic kind of in the first half of the day. We had some, some meetings around an ethics project that we're kind of doing. Spent a bit of time kind of working on those ethics. Took a bit of downtime to like exercise at home and get the blood flow going. And, and now, yeah, so it's, um, it's been a good productive day today. So they're really fascinated about is people's new routines in quarantine. Uh, and it's nice hearing people like find new ways of exercising at home or, you know, what they do in their downtime. It's been such a challenge. I think probably out of, <laughs> out of all, all of the things that are gonna have happened, um, exercise has probably been the toughest one. Because I, I usually kind of go to the gym a lot and, and I like to go to the gym and it's my mental health space and it's just like my thing. <laughs> so translating that to home, I'm just like, what, what do I do? How do I, are, are push-ups enough? Like, <laughs> how, how, how do I kind of work <laughs> out at home? Um, so it's, it's been a little, it took me a little while to adapt, but now it's uh, gone into a good routine. Brilliant. Asiel, you're a, a doctor and medical educator um, who, who's completed your medical training uh, out in Melbourne's West, working across a lot of different fields of medicine. Um, and you've worked with a lot of different communities kind of regarding that as well, from migrants and called, which is culturally and linguistically diverse communities and queer communities. Um, can you tell us about your journey to how you got to where you are now? Yeah, of course. Um, it's, been, it's been a little while. <laughs> it's been a little while in the making. Um, I was kind of born, I was born and raised in Mexico, and I, I did a lot of my education in my high school and all of the basic stuff, I suppose, was, was back in Mexico. And we moved to Australia just as I was about to kind of finish high school. So I was lucky enough to kind of start university here. And throughout that entire time, we always lived in Melbourne's West, which is very multicultural, lots of um, migrant communities, lots of refugee communities. Um, it was really fantastic. And for, for the longest time, I had this perception that Australia was just this big multicultural kind of community. Uh, and then I crossed the river and I was like, in Turak, and I was like, oh gosh, this, <laughs> this is quite different to, to Footscray. <laughs> Doesn't doesn't seem like it's exactly the same. Uh, and I did a lot of my kind of medical training at in Heidelberg at the Austin Hospital. Um, but at the end of it, I was like, oh, I, I still feel like I feel most comfortable working with this kind of cold space in cultural and linguistically diverse communities. Uh, so I went back to kind of the Melbourne's West as soon as I could um, and, and did a lot of my internship and residency and, and beginning registrar years through there. But at the same time, the, the thing that I really, really wanted to do kind of at the end of it all or where I saw myself working in the long term was very much around queer health. Um, so throughout my medical education, I was always kind of looking for more opportunities to get involved into queer health, for educating uh, the rest of my peers around queer health uh, and for um, kind of advocating within the community as well. So getting involved in community organizations and um, projects and whatnot. Um, so, once all my kind of registrar progresses went, went through, uh, I decided to park myself at Northside Clinic, which is a clinic in North Fitzroy um, that looks after a lot of uh, queer communities across Melbourne. And it's been a really, really exciting time. It's kind of the kind of medicine that I've been wanting to do for, for such a long time. And unfortunately, um, the kind of medicine that's not very widespread and not a lot of other practices and other kind of um, uh, medical uh, settings have, have a lot of experience in. So it's been fantastic to actually settle down have a good place where I find my niche and I can actually practice with a community that um, has given me so much in terms of advocacy and you know inspiration and resilience. So it's it's been great to be able to work in that space. Hmm. And when when you are working in queer health, um, obviously apart from just uh, that engagement with community and that particular community, uh, what are the foci and also the challenges that are faced uniquely in the, in that subsector of medicine? Yeah. Look, that's that's a very good question. Um, funnily enough, I think one of the main challenges is actually getting the patient in front of me. Um, and what I mean by that is that a lot of the times people go like, oh, I've been you know, struggling to find uh, a practitioner who's inclusive or who knows about this stuff or who's not going to be judgmental or who I'm not going to have kind of a weird time, um, you know, chatting about my sexuality or my gender identity or, or both, um, who, who is able to actually just provide regular care. Um, and there's, there's kind of a, a couple of, of um, I suppose, classes of patients that we see. There are the patients that are completely A-OK -okay and well and just want kind of an affirming space. Um, 
And, and I think that's one of the fantastic things that that our clinic can provide. And there's the, the patients that need kind of more, more medical care in terms of, um, you know, gender affirmation or looking after um, HIV and sexual health and, and that side of things. Um, so I think one of the biggest barriers is very much just training doctors and training health professionals in general to, to have this affirming practice and for kind of queer individuals of, of you know, all walks of life to be able to walk into any healthcare setting and, and, and feel accepted and feel like this is a place where they're going to get the care that they deserve and the care that they need. Um, so by the time they get to us, they're like, oh, God, finally, I'm, I'm kind of in this, this proper space. And um, it, it, in a way, it makes my job easier because um, I don't have to kind of go through that whole rigmarole of, you know, this is an affirming space. They know that this is an affirming space. And it's just about kind of valuing that and providing the care that they need. Um, that's really interesting. And I, I'm also glad that there's that conversation happening on the broader scale. One of the things that strikes me is, you know, uh, queer health can encompass things like mental health and physical health. But there's also this relationship between, um, I guess, like health and so social stigma or the way that society is built. Uh, does your practice and uh, involve that and, and look at the social determinants as well? Oh yeah, absolutely. And I think uh, with any kind of patient, the the social context just comes into the fore um, for for kind of any patient interaction that that we do have. Um, and let's say in, in a certain way, the um, particularly for for trans and gender diverse individuals uh, who just face so many challenges in, in terms of social affirmation, so many challenges in kind of getting uh, friends and family and work and you know everything kind of lined up. So in a certain way, kind of the, the medical side of things is uh, a little bit of the easier bit. You know, it's, it's relatively straightforward to um, commence people on gender affirmation medication and, and make sure that they're, they're looked after properly from a medical point of view. But what I often find the most challenging are those social elements around it. Um, so kind of making sure that they are safe at home, making sure that they feel like they have a, a, a you know, good supportive space to actually come out and have those discussions, particularly for younger people, you know, making sure that they are well looked after and there's a kind of bit of a safety net around it. Um, so navigating all of those tricky bits um, is often what makes it a bit more challenging. And I suppose uh, as, as a doctor, you're, you can advocate for your patient in many ways, but there are certain ways where, where um, you feel like you can't, and it's quite difficult to fight the social stigma from kind of a medical point of view. So while you're taking it into consideration, um, it's sometimes hard to actually navigate those spaces around it. So we're currently in the midst of a pandemic, um, COVID-19. How has that impacted the way that people are uh, living at home and their mental and physical health? Yeah, and look, that's that's kind of the, the perfect example in terms of how COVID-19 has, has kind of panned out, and particularly with, with the lockdown. Um, I suppose it's, it's affected different communities in, in various different ways, but um, particularly for, for trans and diverse individuals, there's there's been a bit of a delay in, in for example, getting their, their medications. So feeling like they, they can't come to, to you know, get their tea shot or they can't come to, to get their script and they've left it off for, for quite a few months and that might have an impact on their mental health. Um, another big, big one, which um, again, we find it quite, quite difficult to navigate was because all elective surgeries have been essentially closed off and gender affirmation surgeries are considered as an elective surgery. Um, essentially the, the books kind of closed for, for a period of months. Um, and there were people who were obviously in quite quite a lot of distress because they've they've been waiting so long to actually get this surgery, and then they've been told to you know it has to be pushed back until the lockdown finishes or reopens, which you know back in mid March it, it was a very uncertain term on what that would be whether it would be July whether it would be kind of September whether it would be November whether it would be potentially next year, um, so I think there was a lot of uncertainty that made people very very uneasy and definitely had a big impact on on their mental health. And the other thing that, that I always kind of want to keep in the back of my mind is whether people are safe at home. Um, now, unfortunately, with lockdown happening, if you're not in an affirmative space at home, if you feel like your parents can accept you or if you feel like you're you know, not, not quite ready or not safe enough to come up to, to your partner, for example, um, then that's a, that's a bit of a red flag for me. Um, and at that stage, we just have to kind of keep a, a really close eye and, and make sure we support these communities as, as well as we can support them. Um, so it's had a, a really big impact across a number of communities around what we can potentially do and how the lockdown has, has actually impacted people outside of just their, their medical care. Mm. So the three things you uh, mentioned there, access to medication, for example, access to tea, or, um, elective surgeries are all, have been all canceled or rescheduled until much later. 
um, and it may not be safe for people uh, who are now being forced to live in a, a, a potentially hostile environment at home. Yeah, um, yeah, that's right. Um, so it's definitely posed uh, quite a lot of difficulties, particularly for trans and diverse people. Um, but I would also say, I suppose, a, a lot of kind of our queer communities thrive on essentially community, you know, that's kind of the, the whole nexus of it. Um, so it's been interesting to see how, how people kind of adapt differently to having these lockdowns in place and the way that community has reorganized to, to you know, continue to thrive in this environment. Yeah, we're seeing lots of really interesting, um, you know, uh, attempts and, and visions of what a virtual communities look like in, in many different spheres, whether that's, um, I don't know, I'm thinking like Bible studies for churches or drag race shows for queer communities um, that are all happening via Zoom and by different digital yeah. platforms. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's really cool. Have you have you been involved in any of those things or other virtual uh, activities? Um, not particularly in terms of anything in the in the art space. And I feel like I've kind of shut down a little bit in terms of um, kind of uh, attending art space and attending kind of community spaces. Um, but certainly in in the teaching space, you know, everything had to be essentially relocated from from a physical space then to an online format. And that, in a way, was quite challenging. It, yeah, um, to be honest, I feel like I'm a, a little bit zoomed out. <laughs> like there's there's so many Zoom meetings happening, and there's so many kind of events online um, that that it has kind of posed a bit of a challenge, at least for me. But of course, there's there's people who who relish that connection and have thrived very well on, on on making kind of those online connections. I think a lot of us are feeling Zoom fatigue. I certainly am. Uh, when you know I'm staring at my glowing rectangle all day. Yeah, <laughs> it's exhausting, <laughs> and it, it's it's such a different pacing and energy level as well. Yeah, it it definitely takes a um, a different type of emotional energy, I think, to engage kind of online rather than than uh, face to face. At least for me, I haven't, I, I don't get that kind of a um, nice feedback that you get when when you're you know in a space with with someone else. I want to ask more about how that's impacted your role as a medical educator, uh, but. Before that, something struck me when we were talking about largely like pandemics and, and queer health. Um, I often hear people say that we're experienced, we are in, in unprecedented times. And uh, something that's come up as I talk to lots and lots of different people is like, that's not strictly true in so much as we've seen different pandemics and epidemics uh, affect different communities in the past. Um, First Nations people, for example, um, surviving through essentially a, a massive apocalypse. Um, Queer people have been at the forefront of the fight against HIV um, in terms of education, in finding um, uh, management solutions, in removing the stigma. How are the, what are the lessons that we can learn from that pandemic, epidemic, uh, and long emergency, and how can we apply them to this current pandemic of COVID nineteen? Yeah, that's a that's a great question, um, and I often feel a little bit torn about the. The comparison between, for example, something like HIV and AIDS um, and, and COVID-19. And the reason being is that in the kind of HIV and AIDS epidemic very much played out in specifically kind of queer communities. And um, it, it, it really, really had a significant impact across, you know, queer communities in the States and queer communities kind of around the world um, in a way that, that COVID-19 hasn't. Um, so the stigma associated with with the actual disease, and I'm kind of looking at my um, bookshelf over here, and uh, Susan Sontag's kind of AIDS and its metaphors kind of comes to mind. The the way that it kind of embodied uh, a certain stigma is very different to what kind of COVID nineteen has has kind of done. We saw similar type of comparisons be be made, for example, um, in in terms of race. So particularly kind of coming from from America, and we saw so some of it kind of play out here in Melbourne. Um, you know, this, this idea that um, people from Asian backgrounds are, are carriers of the disease or harebrains of the disease and, and a lot of the, the stigma that kind of went around it. And I think the, the biggest kind of lesson for, for it in terms of what we can take away from it um, has been really to kind of work around community um, in, in the way that kind of the HIV and AIDS epidemic rallied community to, to, to really develop some of these fantastic and groundbreaking uh, work in the way that we develop antiretrovirals, the way that um, community members access medication, the way that community members are, are informed. Um, I think something similar could kind of be, be applied to, to COVID-19 and the way that it has completely restructured the, the way that we think about, for example, work from home, the way that we think about how we engage in online spaces, um, the way that we kind of bring those connections together um, has been quite, quite interesting. 
I can't say how it's going to kind of turn out in the long term. I'd be really interested to see what the effects of it are are post you know COVID nineteen, uh, whether there's any long lasting kind of impacts of are we going to see more kind of flexible work hours? Are we going to see different ways of um, engaging community who are, you know, perhaps a little bit more separate by distance that are a bit more kind of disparate around? Um, or are we just going to kind of go back to, to how it all was before? Um, so it's interesting to think about kind of the, the, the ways that those two particular epidemics have reshaped our, our ideas of community and who we connect together. You mentioned, you know, it'll be interesting to see what future we do end up emerging into, whether it's something that tries to hew back to the normal, um, which in my opinion was a type of crisis for certain people, uh, or whether we're going to build a, a totally new future. What are your hopes for what we emerge into? Like, what are the specific things that, that ideally would change? Yeah, I, I think um, out of all of the things, it'd be great to actually, if if COVID by the end of it leaves kind of the, the end of capitalism at its door, it'd be, it'd be fantastic. So, so kind of rechanging the way that we think about economics and wealth distribution in particular is for me probably the biggest thing. And, and we've seen, for example, government uh, in Australia take a much more, um, let's say active role in, um, I'm trying to think of the kind of right words around it because I'm not particularly, you know, politically or, or economically <laughs> kind of educated, but but been a lot more um, proactive in essentially have, having some sort of wealth redistribution and being a little bit more uh, socially mindful, I suppose, in, in their duties. Um, so we can see that kind of ongoing in the long term and then perhaps changing the way, again, that um, labor is, is organized, changing the way that, um, for example, casual workers are re re uh, remunerated, uh, changing the way in, in which uh, for example, even healthcare um, is funded and organized. It'd be quite interesting to see. Um, extending from that, I think one of the interesting things, particularly in the healthcare space, is that this idea of telehealth was was very fringe prior to this. Um, like it was only really done in rural or remote communities where you know the specialist was only available in Melbourne and they would have telehealth appointments once every however long, once every common couple of weeks or once every three weeks. Um, but now it's become so so common common commonplace, and what we're seeing is a lot of people from, you know, rural remote communities who weren't able to access care before are are now able to do that through through telehealth, um, and this idea that you know um, you you physically need to kind of be in the space for everything to be done. We find out that actually no, you can actually do quite a lot just um, on the internet and a phone call. Um, so it'd be interesting to to see how all of those impacts not only impact the economic side of things, but also how it kind of reshapes and, and um, reconfigures healthcare in a way. I think we're in the, the world's largest uh, remote working experiment and the, you know, it's probably going to produce much more results than years and years of uh, carefully thought through research. No offense to the PhDs that are based yeah. themselves on that. Um, yeah, I'm curious as well to see whether telehealth is going to take leaps and bounds in its evolution or its adoption um, from this moment in time. What are your uh, prognostications or hopes for e-health and telehealth in general? I hope it continues to develop, to be honest, because um, it's been quite interesting um, to, to work in this particular space. Um, and at the moment, we're, we're still doing largely telehealth consultations, um, despite, and you know, have the capacity to bring people into the clinic for face-to-face for -face consultations if needed. It does have its limitations, but at the same time, I think the doors that it opened for particularly queer people who are in rural remote regions to, to actually access care um, made, made a, a big difference. Uh, and if that can continue to happen, it'd be, it'd be great. And I think it depends a lot on how the government decides to um, fund or not fund uh, the, let's say, Medicare items for it. Um, because if there is a long-standing, you know, Medicare item for telehealth, people will absolutely go for it. I think that one of the main issues was the, 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 those particular funding items were um, restricted to, to very small populations in the past. But now perhaps if we can make it more widespread and, um, you know, GPs can, can use them. Um, I think in my head, it'll, it'll only increase the access to, to health and healthcare. Right, and increasing access hopefully increases equity uh, across the board. Yeah, that's right. Uh, so I, I did bookmark and say that I would ask you about medical education. Uh, how is, <coughs> pardon me, how's uh, all that going at the moment for you? You know, you, are you giving lectures over uh, Zoom? 
How's yeah, that it's it's quite in, it's quite interesting. Um, in a way that the the lectures are probably the easier bits because you can just kind of plunk yourself and give the presentation and people can kind of rewatch it at their own pace if needed. Um, but what's been really challenging are the kind of smaller tutorials and the the small kind of um, things that used to be a lot more face to face. Um, so it's been interesting trying to navigate that <laughs> while still keeping people's attention for like a long period of time. Um, so over the last kind of couple of weeks, um, I prepared this three hour long webinar on kind of all things queer health for, for medical students. Um, and it was really interesting to see how, how kind of the attention held up over that period of time. And we just had to get really inventive in terms of, you know, lots of breakout rooms, lots of small discussions, lots of kind of quizzes and polls. Um, we had a community member also help co-facilitate that. So it wasn't just me kind of monotonously, you know, going on and on for three hours. Um, so it, it took a lot more effort than I would have expected. <laughs> and in a, you know, kind of physical space, you can organize all of those things very easily by kind of breaking up the table separately or by, um, you know, having a kind of quick break in the lectures or um, by kind of shifting the energy in the room. But it's a lot harder to, to manage over you know, um, Zoom and digital spaces. I, I don't know how, how, how um, have you ever had kind of those experiences of taking part in kind of panel discussions or kind of talks where, you know, the it's hard to gauge the energy in the room. <laughs> Absolutely. The, the metaphor that just popped into my head is like, um, there's, there's this viscous, uh, how do I put it? It's as if there's something blocking, right? It's like, <laughs> I guess the, the screen, but like you, you, you don't get the, um the feeling the mood the affect you can't read the room uh there's just so many things wrong <laughs> with the situation and it requires it, a total reappraisal of yeah how, how to hold energy and take space yeah it's absolutely impossible to to kind of read the room well at least it <laughs> kind of what what we've done so far and i can sometimes see that you know in the little kind of squares that um students look quite kind of bored and disengaged but then when i ask a question they give really insightful answers and on the, on the other hand, there's also students that seem like really engaged and that they're thinking about it. And then when I ask the question, they, they just kind of give very wafty answers that, you know, perhaps their mind was somewhere else, but it's just really hard to gauge <laughs> kind of where they're at. <laughs> the, um, the awful trick that I'll pass on now is like, if you, if you have your phone and you put it right here, you can uh, like scroll Instagram. And <laughs> yeah. that, is a, that is a good trick. I'll keep, keep that in mind for <laughs> when I'm seeing people kind of, too, too close to their screen. Mm. <laughs> yeah, might not work if you're wearing glasses. Oh, that's true. Okay. Everything you gets reflected, particularly for these ones, they get reflected, like you can see the lights being reflected on. But anyway, we'll see. Um, and so, okay, a more broad question. What is it that you are teaching um, in your capacity as a teacher? Yeah, look, um, teaching a little bit of everything at the moment. Um, so I kind of have my fingers in pretty much all of the pies in Victoria. In terms of, I, I usually give a lecture um, for Deakin Medical School in terms of queer health. And I have to say, most of the teaching revolves around queer health. Um, I also teach at Monash in the first year medical students. And we have this fantastic um, subject called health, knowledge, and society, which is kind of the exploring the interface of precisely all of those elements, how, how the society inter, uh, interface with, with healthcare systems. Uh, and it's a really, really fascinating discussion. Um, it's very, very different, I think, to what a lot of medical students are, are used to because, you know, they're used to rote learning and sitting down and memorizing lists of things. Um, but this one's a lot more discussion based and a little bit more kind of humanities oriented. So, you know, it's like, oh, how does capitalism affect, you know, um, cardiac disease? And they're like, what? <laughs> so it's uh, it's very, very different, but very, very engaging. And at, uh, at Melbourne Uni... Important? Oh, sorry, oh, just before yeah. you're gonna... Yeah, why, why is that important for medical students to learn? Oh, I think it is just absolutely, you can't, in a way, you can't be a doctor without knowing around the, the social context that, that you're working in. Um, so for every patient that kind of presents through in order for you to have a really good understanding and for, for you to really provide the, the best healthcare that you can for that particular person, you need to understand kind of where, where their social context is coming from. Um, so when I was working, obviously, in, in, for example, the Western suburbs, which was lar largely migrant and refugees and asylum seekers, um, having an understanding of what that particular experience may have entailed um, meant that, you know, you were able to look after things more than just what they presented with, or you were able to look into, um, you know, their, their health in a way that was a little bit more holistic. 
And similarly for, right. for kind of, um, if you work in an area which was uh, predominantly, you know, low socioeconomic background, um, you have a much more better understanding of, okay, well, perhaps let's um, do certain investigations in a certain way, or perhaps let's do, uh, you know, referrals in a certain way to kind of minimize the economic impact. Um, I know that that particular person probably will never be able to afford kind of a private referral. So we're really going to focus on making a public referral and what do we have to do in order to actually do that? Um, Whereas, for example, now that I'm working in Fitzroy, which is a bit more of an affluent area and a lot more people are happy to have a private referral, it's it's a lot more like, oh, okay, well, here you go. <laughs> we don't have to do all, all the kind of um, investigations and all the work that, that a public referral kind of entails. Um, and just being aware of all of those, uh, I think, are able to, to provide the healthcare that you need to provide a lot better. Right. So it's like, even if you only cared about the pathophysiological outcomes of a patient and like really... <laughs> Uh, didn't see them as a holistic human being, um, you're saying that this approach would still actually uh, pragmatically solve those things better as well. Um, but then like, yeah. on top of that, we shouldn't see health as just the absence of disease. Yeah, yeah no, absolutely. Um, I think it, it helps in just understanding the, the kind of person that you're working with a lot, a lot better. Um, and yeah, it helps you provide um, a lot more complete kind of healthcare around it. And it's, it's really hard to get that idea across when, um, you know, they're first year medical students, they're just trying to get your head around like anatomy and, uh, you know, uh, the <laughs> gigantic number of medications that we have to kind of memorize and kind yeah, of chucking these, these big picture ideas student. are difficult. <laughs> oh, yeah. And like, uh, you might have, was awesome. Yeah, I was going to say, you probably had it, but it was, um, it, it just kind of recently underwent a bit of a facelift. Um, because I taught it, I've been teaching it for a couple of years, and we used to have like really dry, horrible readings. Um, and now they're a lot more kind of fun and engaging, and there's a lot more like videos, and there's a lot more. It's just a lot. Take my word for it; it's just a lot better. <laughs> I I clearly missed out. No, that's not true. I, I enjoyed like sociology and chessy, and um, actually one of the best lectures was Margaret Hayes talking about the John Money um, cases. You know, oh, yeah, relating yeah. it to trans and gender diverse health. Um, so yeah, if it's improved, all the better for, for the future doctors. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's. I think probably out of all of them, that's probably been the, the challenge, the, the one with the most challenge to translate into a digital space, just because it is, again, difficult to hold space, in, particularly in a discussion-based tutorial um, and kind of organizing who's going to talk at what time and, you know, organizing the and, and steering the discussion for, for a group of like 17 people is, is a bit more challenging. Um, but it, nonetheless, it's been, uh, yeah, very rewarding. That's awesome. And then because I cut you off, the, the thing that you were going to say next was you also have a role at Melbourne University. Yeah, that's right. And probably that's kind of um, my, my biggest role at the moment. Um, so I'm involved in the Department of Teaching at General Practice. And we, we do a bit of everything. We do we help out with some lectures. We help out with some tutorials. We help out with some kind of clinical discussions. We do marking. We do... Um, setting the some of the exam questions which is really interesting because i feel like i just sat the, those exams like <laughs> not too long ago and it's been really <laughs> weird kind of being on the flip side and going like oh i remember hating this assessment <laughs> and i have to be the one that's kind of like grading them and marking them and setting them so it's been yeah interesting uh Asiel, it's been such a pleasure talking with you about queer health communities um and your practice and, and and also medical education it's it's really great to be able to tie all these things together um is, are there ways that we can support you in your work or look into it further uh yes absolutely i, I guess one of the things that has been kind of a, a little bit of my baby in the background was um as a medical student i, I realized that there wasn't a lot of teaching on, on queer health um so we got this very small grant from the university of melbourne to develop essentially an online resource um, that has case scenarios, that has lectures in it, that has um, all this information around queer health that it's very, very hard to kind of come by in, in medical education in general. Um, the website is called wavelengthmeded.org.au um, and you can access it and see all this really great stuff that um, we've been working on for, for the last kind of few years. I think if I'm quick enough, wait, hang on. Uh, what, what was it called? Wavelength uh, Med. It's called Wavelength, that's right. right? That's right. Wavelength MedEd. Boom. 
<laughs> Got it. Yes. <laughs> Fantastic. Great. Oh. 10 out of 10. Those are some quick fingers. <laughs> <laughs> Still like playing around with this platform. Brilliant. Well, we'll go check out that resource. Thank you once again for your time uh, and take care. Likewise. Have a lovely night. Thank you. Uh, this is the distillery that you've been watching. I'm your host, Harry Lee Shanglun. New episodes are streamed daily, so do check back on our website, distillery.site, Instagram at distillery.site, Twitter at distillery.site, uh, or, I don't know, chat to me. Give me a phone call. Anyway, see you tomorrow. Bye.